to be back here at the National Academies uh, and the National Academy of Engineering for this event. Uh, I always go into it uh, a little, little hesitant. I'm, I'm honored to be invited, but uh, pretty much everything we ever discuss here is over my head. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and the audience, uh, any one of whom uh, is smarter than I am on these topics. But I, I, it's a challenge to me because it's a, an intellectual challenge to get up to speed enough on a topic so that we can moderate a great discussion uh, among some very, very smart people. And once again, uh, the National Academy of Engineering never disappoints. The panel is full of uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, panelists who are really, really well informed in their space. And I'd like to invite them to the podium uh, now, starting, uh, you heard them introduced and their bios are in your, uh, in your packages, but I want to invite Professor Robert Nichols, who uh, you heard speak uh, last night. Uh, I want to invite uh, David Pierce from Consolidated uh, Edison, uh, Kathleen White from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Bart DeYoung from the, uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and Rear Admiral Brett Meilenberg uh, from the U.S. Navy. If I can ask you all to take your positions up here, here's how this is going to work. First of all, we are live streaming this event, so don't swear when you ask questions. Uh, you can, uh, you can live stream if you want to tell those of uh, your colleagues or, or your family who aren't here. They can go to nae.edu and they can uh, watch it there. Uh, how many of you tweet? I'm hoping this gets better every year when I ask. I, yeah, no, not so much. Okay. Kind of like well, us. Well, for all three of you, uh, the handle is uh, at nae underscore dc and the hashtag is uh, NAEAM, NAE Annual Meeting 2016. And the four of us are going to have a f tremendous time tweeting at each other. Um, huh? Normally, I, this is where I tell people my hashtag, at Ali, or my handle, which is at Ali Velshi. But again, it's nice to know more about something than some of you do. Um, so forget about the whole tweeting thing. Um, we're going to be live streaming. The way it's going to work is each of our panelists is going to give a presentation for a few minutes. And as Dan said, they all have very different areas of expertise, but they all have something very meaningful to, to talk about with respect to sea level rise and the challenges, and particularly the engineering challenges inherent. You will hear from uh, uh, the science and engineering side. You'll hear from uh, you'll hear about military pre preparedness, you'll hear about industry preparedness, and you'll hear uh, policy discussions about how we should be thinking about these things. And what will happen is after everybody has spoken, we might take a bit of a, a bathroom break, um, but uh, then we'll come back and we'll have a, a discussion uh, between and among the panelists. And we will do what we always do. We'll take it out to you. You see the two mics here. You'll line up. You'll ask your questions. One or two of you will, uh, will give a dissertation, I'm sure. Uh, and we'll have a robust conversation about that. And we'll keep that part fluid. Uh, some of it will go back to the panel for some discussion. We'll come back to you. But I do want you, as you're listening to the, preparation, to, to the presentations, to think about questions that you have that aren't answers, answered or ideas that you have. Uh, this is one of those great topics that is not in everybody's area of expertise, but affects every single one of us. So uh, we will really benefit from your interaction on this. Uh, but that'll be in a little bit. I want to start by in, uh, inviting Professor Nichols up to the podium to uh, give his presentation. Robert Nichols. Well, good morning. Um, I want to sort of build a little bit on some of the things I said yesterday. So um, for those of you who listened to me yesterday, you've seen, I think, these slides before. But it's, and it's really to think, when we think about adaptation to sea level rise, what can we learn from London? What can be transferred to other places, both in the United States, but globally as well? So this is the Thames barrier. It's the um, it's closed, so there are these gates that sit in the bed of the, of the Thames, and uh, when a, tide, a storm tide is forecast in the North Sea, they close, and they keep, um, they keep London dry, so this area is meant to get wet, uh, and 
the areas being protected are upstream uh, of the barrier. Those of you who saw the talk yesterday will recognise that this is part of a system of defences. There's 337 kilometres of dike linked to, these, to the barrier. It's just one element in a much more complex system. So in, when you're talking about adapting it, you need to really think about um, the costs of raising all those areas. And sea level was factored into the design of the Thames barrier, not Climate change wasn't put on the agenda, but in the this was the planning started in 1953, um, and they recognised that sea levels in London were rising, and extreme sea levels in London were rising, and so they built the barrier actually 50 centimetres taller than you, it needed to be if you'd assumed a constant sea level. So they actually factored in that just based on historical um, evidence from records in London, and so there was an expectation that you'd have to adapt it after, 50, after a 50-year design life, it would need to be upgraded. Along comes global warming, suddenly that becomes a much more uncertain issue about how we can actually deal with that. Um, and you know, you kind of get the problem shown here that you know, we have maybe the sort of, we're down here in the, in the green area where risk is acceptable, I mean there's a, defined, there's a legally defined um, standard of protection associated with this structure, and with time, due to climate change, sea level rise, but also more people and property, the, f the defences are wearing out. I mean, so there's inf inf the infrastructure is ageing, so we need to, there's renewal needs. We have, a we have a decline in, an increase in risk towards unacceptable levels. What can we do about that? Well, we could think about a major investment now and spending a lot of money on something that might not happen, or might happen much more slowly than we expect. And so the thought was really what we want to move on to is some kind of adaptive management shown in green here where we um, respond to um, sea level rise uh, and the changing risk. I mean, it's, it could, the it's really responding to the changing risk. And so it's also these other factors are important in the decision. So it's not just sea level rise, it's all drivers of risk. And we only do things uh, when we actually uh, need to. And then rather than spending money on renewal, actually developing a plan to actually do something about that. And so, for, as I said, £15 million was spent on this project, and it's all about a plan for managing this uh, infrastructure. And they threw away time, which is an interesting point. If you look at this plot, it's going from zero up to four metres or more. It's purely in a sea level space. We don't know when we'll reach those sea levels. And so, but, but when you're thinking about standards of defence, it, it, it's quite easy just to do this sort of sea level space plot. And there's a lot of different, for, for a small amount of sea level rise, but the existing system is fine. So basically you learn what point do you have to uh, start doing something. Once you move beyond the point where the existing system is okay, there's lots and lots of different options that are available. Um, and as you move up, and not surprisingly, at some point, Really, either you have to build a massive new barrage or you abandon, you abandon parts of London, which wasn't an option in the assessment, but you know, it's clearly the choice that you're facing um, when you get to that. But, and that's, that, that lies in about three metres. They thought about very large changes. Most of the um, thinking would probably be zero to one, but they actually are going up here to four, five metres of change. So things that might not happen for hundreds of years, maybe never even will happen, but are still asking the question, what could we do if this happened? And putting together, that, that, and then in terms of the actual expectations of climate science, um, this is what's expected, so this is what's been planned for, but this could, ch and this is the high end, this is maybe considered to be the worst case um, in the 21st century, but the science can change and these numbers can move. If we find we're overestimating, we might move down. If we find uh, we're underestimating, it might move up. But this clearly provides a structure where that doesn't matter. We can very rapidly reinterpret new information and, make, and, and still move forward with decision making. And actually, we have a project at Southampton, um, which I'm involved in, which is trying to link together sea level predictions with this kind of approach to give the environment agency who will be responsible for this structure um, time to do something about it. So if we move more, uh, and that is the um, proposed plan at the present time, the pathway that will be followed through this, um, through these options, but there's choices there. You can change your mind as well. You're not, you're not locked into that, uh, at least at this stage. 
And these are the 136 cities around the world um, with more than a million people in 2005. And I think that London experience brings home that people ask, when will these cities have problems? And the honest answer in most cases is, I'm not really sure I know. But taking the uh, philosophy that, we've, that I just showed with London, it's, a, it's not about upgrading the Thames barrier. It's really about trying to understand when does sea level rise become a problem for these places? And uh, clearly, it's not one, it's not binary. It's a series of steps. Uh, and to really put into context when um, th these problems will emerge and what can you do about it. And sometimes the solutions will be really easy and cost nothing, so it's a no-brainer. Sometimes there may be real challenges, but at least you start to think about those challenges today so that you can be more prepared for them if they do eventually emerge. And lastly, I think in terms of, th there's an important part here that sea level is often showing you, or generally showing you, the problems you already have. It's not like sea level creates completely new problems. If you're flood prone, um, if you're getting flooded by sea level rise, you're probably flood prone today. It also allows you to assess your current preparedness for things like Hurricane Matthew. So I think it also is a very useful reflection on today's risks and are you ready for today, which is as important, obviously or maybe more important than the issue um, of sea level rise. Thanks very much. Thanks, Professor Nichols. Uh, and we're going to have some questions around that and, uh, and a lot more discussion. I want to call on uh, Kate White. Uh, she is with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. She's an expert in the planning, the engineering, design, and operations to reduce vulnerability and increase resilience in the Corps of Engineers built in natural infrastructure. She's a civil engineer and she's the lead uh, climate preparedness and resilience community of practice at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Institute for Water Resources. Uh, Dr. Kate White. So actually, I'm quite pleased to follow Robert because he set up my talk very well. Um, I'm showing the um, front page of the New York Times in September of this year, and it was talking about flooding of the coast has already begun. So it's the same thing that Robert said. It's not that it's going to be new challenges. It's the same challenges we're facing perhaps more frequently and with more severe um, circumstances. So um, and that's why I'm actually calling this adaptation to rising sea level when, not if. In the US, for many years, it was if we get a rise in sea level, if things happen. But frankly, things have been happening for a long time. We have structures ourselves that have lost a foot due to sea level rise, and they were built in the 60s, all right? So the Corps of Engineers has had guidance since 1986 on sea level rise, and I'm glad to hear that the UK started in the 50s. Uh, but here, um, you know, people, the people are just beginning to understand. Uh, we previously called this kind of issue where a tide causes flooding, nuisance flooding, but that gives the impression that it's not really a problem. And in fact, it's becoming chronic flooding. And the issues that happen when you lose your transportation links are life safety issues, public health and safety issues. You can't get uh, the police, the emergency medical folks, you can't evacuate in these kinds of situations. So it's not just the emergency management type issues that the Corps of Engineers is facing, it's all of our missions and operations. So a major portion of our work is dedicated to making sure that the ports and the commercial navigation system work in all different kinds of situations. And you can imagine that for every reason under the sun, this infrastructure is right at sea level. Another one is ecosystem restoration. This is a photograph of the Everglades, and the Everglades are right now facing saltwater intrusion from rising sea levels that are impacting the viability of the native species and allowing invasive species to come in. So we need to figure out how we could possibly manage these situations. There are unavoidable situations resulting from climate change, and we need to manage them, and that's really what engineering is about. What's the problem solving? So another facet is threatened and endangered species. It's hard to tell which of these species is a keystone, keystone species that really would have an incredible effect on the rest of the, the um, ecosystem, and so therefore we really need to take care of them now, but we're losing habitat. We need to figure out how to keep increasing that habitat or at least having it keep pace. For the Corps of Engineers, coastal storm risk reduction is a major factor. We spend quite a bit of time and energy on shoreline erosion control. And then, of course, our military missions support the Department of Defense and the other services. 
And of course, many of these are at sea level, and you'll hear more about these later. So the Corps of Engineers has what we call a resilience initiative. It's really taking the principles that we've been engineering to for many years, preparing for events. Since the early 1800s, we've been preparing for the future events that could be necessary for engineers to solve and for the Corps in particular to respond to. <laughs> Absorbing different kinds of events. How do we prepare the infrastructure and the people around it to absorb as much as possible the disruptions? quick recovery, recovering from these events, and then adaptation, which is not rebuilding, it's moving forward to a more resilient, a better prepared, uh, higher level of, of absorption and easier to recover. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different kinds of infrastructure, but you're hearing more on the structural here. So I'm starting with these commonly, um, commonly understood levees, coastal levees, Storm surge barriers, we've just heard about the Thames Barrier, and we're going to hear more seawalls and revetments, uh, very popular and in many places, but also have negative effects on the adjoining areas. Groins, detached breakwaters, and things like that. Since Hurricane Sandy, there's been a renewed emphasis in using natural and nature-based features to attenuate uh, waves and to decrease the energy that's reaching the shore that causes damage. So engineered dunes and beaches are something that the Corps has dealt with for a long time. Uh, but the use of maritime forests, such as mangroves, uh, in other countries has shown us that these could be effective here. Obviously, barrier islands, which we tend to try and hold in place here in the US, but are things that are designed to move with different levels of energy from the ocean. Uh, they protect the inland areas, oyster reefs and coral reefs, if we can continue to manage these in the face of increasing ocean acidification, they could be a viable solution. And then the idea of vegetated features. The problem is there isn't much engineering reliability and performance information. It's difficult to design these aside from the be beaches and dunes so that we can actually achieve a reliable performance and risk reduction. And then last, we can't engineer our way out of every challenge. Uh, we could solve problems forever and come up with solutions, but they might not be economically viable. They might not be the solution, the right solution for the people. It's like abandoning London. It's going to be difficult to abandon Washington or, or New York or New Orleans. But we can't engineer our way out of every challenge, and that's why there's a suite of solutions. They're really policy solutions, and the kinds of things that people like you who are thoughtful and understand the science and the engineering behind the solutions can help with floodplain and policy management, flood warning and preparedness, kind of a no-brainer as we saw during Matthew recently, relocation, and flood proofing and impact reduction. Again, during the preparations for Matthew, you saw a lot of people putting up plastic and sandbags and flood walls around their buildings and, uh, to, to keep them going. So I'm gonna focus on two of them. First, floodplain policy and management. This is something that is not the purview of the federal government. It is the purview of the communities and the states. But it's exactly the kind of work that engineers can support by really coming up with solutions to identify where the particular kinds of events are going to occur in the, f in the future and how we can make floodplain management a real alternative. So I'm going to give that the, the grand, grand prize winner here. And then relocation. I want people to think more about this. Typically, the American response is, no, I'm going to stand right here. I'm going to rebuild. I'm going to do the same thing I always have. I'm going to hold the line. And the fact is, it's not always the right solution. In the past, when we've relocated houses one by one or a business one by one, that's been a failure because you lead to issues like advanced um, uh, public safety issues, uh, just houses left by themselves, or issues with the utilities trying to provide power or transportation to a very few residents. So I think the thing that we're looking at now, and why I've given this the, the sustainability award for the future, is relocation of communities, entire communities, whether they're a political boundary of a community or just a group of close-knit people. Uh, we saw during Hurricane Sandy that there were uh, decreased deaths in the Rockaways and other locations because people took care of each other. They went to check on the elderly. They went to check on the infirm. They made sure that everybody was okay. So here's an example of a group that's, re that's recently received a HUD resilience grant uh, to, re to relocate the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw tribe in Ile de Jean Charles, Louisiana. Uh, another example is um, Kivalina, Alaska, with this nice, bright, shiny Corps of Engineers revetment, giving it about 15 years before they have to actually be gone. 
Uh, Kivalina, again, nice revetment showing up there, again, Alaska. Um, and then another one that I'm really encouraging people to look at, and this is the um, Quineal Tribal Nation in Washington State, and what they're doing is moving from an exposed beach area up to a higher area, and they're designing their, their new home to be exactly what they want it to be. So these people are making a more sustainable home that pays homage to their, to their culture and allows them to thrive in the 21st century rather than spending a lot of time recovering from different kinds of events. So I do uh, recommend that people think about this relocation. There's a tremendous amount of engineering that's associated with this, and I think this could be an opportunity for all of us in the future. So that's my last slide. I want to call now upon uh, Rear Admiral Brett Meilenberg. He's the Commander of Naval Facilities Engineering Command and Chief of Civil Engineers. Well, good morning and thank you very much <clears throat> for the invitation to join this distinguished group and this distinguished panel this morning. Uh, as the Commander of NAFAC, that's the Naval Facilities Engineering Command, I'm privileged to lead 22,000 personnel around the globe who take care of Navy and Marine Corps infrastructure at over 100 major installations. We plan, design, build, and maintain facilities, and we deliver environmental services, utility services, and other base services. Uh, two of my predecessors are members of your academy, Admiral Nash and Admiral Johnson, are in the audience here this morning. So good morning, gentlemen. Good to see you out there. Sea level rise poses a real unconventional threat to us and our installations, and we must continue to take measures that we know and understand today while acceler accelerating our efforts to learn more about what our next steps must be. A discussion of sea level rise begins with a discussion of America's Navy. This is your Navy. Uh, you hire us to protect and defend America, our allies, and our partners from, ha from harm around the globe. The world has become a much more globalized place, as you're well aware, and that trend is accelerating. With our Coast Guard and international partners, we continue to ensure we have access to international waters, we keep shipping lanes open, and we provide humanitarian and disaster relief wherever it's needed. We strive to deter aggression and encourage peaceful conflict of resolution in accordance with international law and norms. But should that fail, uh, your Navy is ready to fight. Think of your Navy as America's away team, uh, where we never won a home game. Where do we operate? Uh, the reddish lines, I really like this slide, the reddish lines uh, show shipping lanes in the world's oceans. The deeper the red, the higher the density. Free flow of goods over the world's oceans is a national and international security issue. One quarter of all U.S. jobs, that's 38 million jobs, are directly or indirectly tied to this international trade. And I suspect all of our global partners and allies would have a similar statistic. 95% of all uh, international uh, phone traffic and, and internet traffic is transmitted via underwater cables. And the Navy operating forward with our partners ensures this free flow of goods and communications and that it remains unimpeded. The blue and red dots, if you can see them, maybe a little hard to see, uh, represent significant locations where we have Navy and Marine Corps installations around the globe. As you would expect, most are on the water. And while we may deter human adversaries with our muscle, that's our carriers, our submarines, and our aircraft, uh, Mother Nature is not intimidated by any of those. Many of these coastal installations from which Navy and Marine Corps um, platforms and families live, train, and operate uh, are set to be affected dramatically by sea level rise. Our challenges. Our coastal insulations are exposed to flooding, inundation, 
storm surge, erosion, saltwater intrusion. We've seen these effects already. Uh, we are believers. We understand uh, what we are facing to a degree. We need to understand a lot more. But dealing with these phenomena, just to ensure the daily operation of our bases is concerning enough. But we also have to think about this from the perspective that we are uh, first responders to crises, to humanitarian crises, to disasters, to other crises around the world. So not only do we have to be able to um, uh, respond quickly to uh, get the base up, but we have to then push forward from that base, which provides additional challenges to us. A recent study by the Union of Concerned Scientists studied 18 military installations on the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. Twelve of the 18, uh, I'm sad to say, were Department of Navy facilities, and it causes me great concern. One of the most severely affected here is Naval Air Station Key West. By the end of the century, between 70 to 95 percent of this insulation is projected to be inundated with daily flooding. It's a challenge to me uh, to be in the situation of having uh, imperfect knowledge. Uh, I would love to be able to engineer our way out of this with your help, uh, but it requires narrowing the uncertainty from are we talking about three feet? Are we talking about six feet? That's very important for all of us engineers to understand that. The better the science, the better the decision making, and the better that I can take care of with my colleagues uh, your tax dollars and improve the mission. Uh, very important to me, particularly with the constrained funding environment that we live in today, where it's difficult enough today to take care of our Department of Navy and Department of Defense infrastructure with the shore funding that is available to us. So this challenge layered on top uh, makes it a particularly ch challenging situation. What are we doing today? Presidential and Department of Defense guidance, emerging Department of the Navy guidance. Uh, we're improving our knowledge and our vulnerability assessments at all of those bases that I showed on a previous slide. Uh, improving our risk management plans on how to prepare, how to respond. We're mitigating current hazards for the installations what we have. We have a lot of infrastructure, a lot invested in our installations, and it's not practical to start over in very many places. We must protect what we have through means that we understand and build further capacity. Uh, we've improved our design standards, our design and construction criteria, which many of you are well aware of, to help us do the right thing with future construction. And uh, in places, we're building enduring adaptation measures uh, to, uh, to harden the shoreline and prevent, for example, erosion. What more must we do? This is a picture of Naval Station Norfolk. Uh, the largest concentration of uh, naval power in the world. Much more we must do. In addition, in addition to increasing our knowledge and protective measures, uh, we really need to be on, move beyond the installation fence line. Um, water does not honor the fence line, right? It affects the community. And so perhaps more than any other issue we face, the cooperation, coordination between the installation and the community um, in a multidisciplinary way, way is going to be extremely important to tackling this problem. We have some examples where that's happening. I think this effort really is in its infancy and it's an area where we need to improve. So with this challenge, there's no rush for the weary. Much more we must do to ensure that your Navy and Marine Corps installations are ready to carry out the mission that you have given us. I look forward to further discussion on this today and much more work together. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. As um, 
as Professor Nichols pointed out, uh, there aren't new problems that are brought on by the rise in sea level, but they will exacerbate other problems that you've got. Uh, I want to now introduce David Pierce. He's the manager of Manhattan Operations and Engineering at Consolidated Edison, uh, and to talk about the, the preparations that, that Con Ed and other public utilities are making, not just for sea level rise, but for other matters that challenge our basic infrastructure. Just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to present to such a distinguished panel. Uh, you know, the hard work that uh, you've done throughout your careers uh, is what really gives us the ability in industry to be able to maintain the infrastructure that our society needs. So in the electric sector, uh, we tend to think about sea level rise um, along with the broader topic of climate change. Uh, and we, t we face significant impacts from it, both in terms of electricity power generation, how it affects our power plants, as well as the distribution infrastructure. Uh, the impacts to the electricity sector are disparate based on location and topography. So the impacts that we're going to see in a place such as New York is different than what you might see in other parts of the globe, um, in other cities that are close to the sea. Uh, the sea level rise primarily for us is, is, uh, is an issue that aggravates the coastal storm impact. So in 2012, when Hurricane Sandy came to New York, there was unprecedented flooding. Uh, we projected uh, a 100 year storm impact and we got what was to, at that point in time, 500 year storm impact. Uh, we lost a uh, generating station, which had over half a million people out of electricity in Manhattan for a week. Now, when you lose electricity in this day and age, it's not simply a matter of, well, I can't turn on my television, I can't turn on my radio. In a city, it's pumping water up to the higher floors, it's people being able to walk up and down multiple stairs. Uh, there wasn't the uh, gas stations couldn't pump gasoline, so the transportation system fell apart. Uh, the phone towers, cell phone towers, they ran out of power, so communication fell apart. So it has a really significant ripple effect, any kind of impact on the electricity system. So what we've done and what some of our other peers have done is we've relocated some equipment. Some equipment which was low to the ground, we've elevated. Uh, some equipment we've not been able to relocate, so we've hardened. So we've had to come up with new designs and we've had to uh, retrofit in existing, infra in existing uh, civil infrastructure to be able to make the equipment submersible. Uh, we also recognize that going forward, not just uh, storm, storm surge is going to be an issue, but the, the higher temperatures that we're, we expect to see from global warming could lead to higher electricity demand, which is another challenge that we have to face. So, okay, you have to harden the facilities you have, but then also now you have to meet a greater demand. Interestingly enough, we, we're talking about uh, climate, we're talking about uh, uh, sea level rise, but there's also a correlative in some places you're gonna see more droughts, which is going to impact uh, one of the big renewable sources in a place like New York, hydroelectric power generation, uh, which is one of the things that we can try to do to reduce climate impact overall. Uh, we also are expecting to see stronger hurricanes uh, because you have sea level rise, warmer, temp warmer temperatures, which gives more energy to the hurricanes. So we see uh, a challenge going forward for us, both in terms of ensuring that our infrastructure is resilient, uh, but also in terms of meeting growing demand. Mitigation strategies. Uh, the presenters before have talked about a number of the strategies that have been in place on the, in the city level. You can talk about barriers, uh, you can talk about relocation, raising equipment. Uh, in, the electric, in the electric sector, we see it as requiring a collaborative approach. It's going to be in cases where the city or the state has decided they'll put a barrier up, uh, you won't see the actual inundation reaching to our equipment. In some cases where uh, that's not the case, then we will have to selectively harden some of our inf infrastructure. Uh, we also believe that there, is, uh, there are steps that are required to blunt the overall trajectory of climate change. Uh, in New York State, for example, 
Uh, the Public Service Commission is leading the Renew and the Energy Division, which is setting out uh, targets for greenhouse gas reductions as well as changing the, make the makeup of the electric grid architecture. As an industry, we have uh, promoted the reduction in use of electricity through energy efficiency and end use management. Uh, new technologies in building sciences and in architecture has significantly reduced the, the usage per person and per square foot uh, in Manhattan. And we continue to see that as a, as a key enabler for us going forward. Uh, we continue to invest in climate resilient infrastructure and we are continuing to invest in and encourage the uh, deployment of renewable energy technologies, as well as investment in low carbon or even carbonless technologies for electricity generation. Um, so uh, that's, that's where we are and that's, that's uh, our plan going forward. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, one of the issues we have with the sea level rise and climate change is that uh, it is not upon us all the time. We tend to respond to events uh, and be reactive to them. Some of those events uh, you just heard David talk about with, with Superstorm Sandy. Um, but for some people in the world, uh, this is ever present. And for the folks who live in the Netherlands, that is the case. They uh, take this sea level business very seriously. Uh, Bart de Young joins us from the Netherlands. He is the counselor for infrastructure and the environment. And he's gonna sort of bring a lot of this together because they've had to think about the engineering, they've had to think about the, uh, the building challenges and the changes that are coming. So it'll be interesting to hear how it all comes together with Bart de Young, thank you. Good morning to you all. It's an honor for me to uh, speak here and uh, share our uh, experiences in the Netherlands with uh, sea level rise, which actually is not something of the last century. There have been uh, periods of sea level rise in the medieval times, in the 12th, 13th century also. Uh, and we were there already, and we were all there, ready there fighting the sea. Uh, in order to understand the importance uh, of uh, sea level rise uh, to the Netherlands, it's also, uh, I, I show you this, this uh, a map of the Netherlands and to give you an idea on, of uh, the extent of, of the area that, that is prone to flooding. The area that you see over here uh, on the map, the blue area is uh, below se uh, sea level actually, is 26% of the country, containing all the major population areas. It's Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, all the areas are below sea level and uh, prone to flooding. And there's another 60% uh, of the country which is prone to flooding from, uh, let's say, river floods. Yeah. Um, this low-lying area, 60, it contains 16% of the population and 70% of the GDP is actually earned in that area. And what I forgot to tell you is that the Netherlands actually is basically a one alluvial plain. It's, it's, a, it's a delta, one big delta of the Rhine River, Scheldt River and Meuse River coming from Germany and France. Um, we've been fighting the sea for over a thousand years actually. And, uh, well, that gave us this, this, this uh, stereotype image of a country uh, uh, dotted with uh, windmills to keep our feet dry. Um, but in the 20th century, actually, uh, uh, the floods um, um, became more prominent. We had uh, severe floods in 16, 1916, 1926, and 1953. And our first reaction was actually to build ever higher dams, levees, and what have you, dikes. Um, these are the examples of the 20th century, the enclosure dam, which is actually a 30-kilometer uh, long dam enclosing, uh, cutting off a, an inland sea, which uh, caused a severe flood in uh, 1916. Um, the Delta Project, which, which was started in, um, after, I must say, the uh, major flood we had in 1953, which cost about uh, 1,800 lives. It was a huge project, which cut off all the uh, estuaries in the southwest of the country. Uh, and uh, the closure a bit of it was uh, a removable storm surge barrier into the Rhine River, or the mouth of the Rhine River, up to the port of Rotterdam, and that was finished actually in 1997. In the um, 1990s, actually, um, we had uh, very severe threats of river flooding, and you can see a picture of that the, on the right top of, of, the, uh, of the slide. Uh, we had been actually uh, ris rising these, uh, uh, heightening these uh, levees along the rivers for some century, for, for some uh, decades uh, at the time. 
but these uh, threats of, of uh, river floods in um, the 1990s actually made us rethink our flood policy in the Netherlands. Um, the climate change in the Netherlands is uh, causing um, uh, a number of problems actually. This is a cross uh, section of the, um, of the country. Um, I think one third of the country's coastline is uh, defended by natural dunes. That's uh, the part that you see over here. And the rest is, uh, is about an another 300 kilometers, which is actually protected by dikes. Well, we have um, a number of, of uh, challenges in the 20th century. Sea level rise, of course, that's what's been uh, pointed out already. The estimates change uh, vary uh, a lot, I must say. Uh, this, this peak still of uh, 85 centimeters uh, in, in the next 100 years. We are expecting uh, more than a meter at the moment, last calculation, latest calculations. More extreme storms have been pointed out. Increased erosion because of the storms, which is uh, uh, causing a problem with the dunes. We uh, see increased river discharges in times of heavy rainfall. Uh, also decreased river discharges in times of drought, which is causing another problem. Um, subsidence of the earth, of the soil not only because of um, 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 uh, uh, decreased river discharges, but also because of uh, melting ice caps. Uh, there is an isostatic uh, equilibrium. If uh, Scandinavia, the ice cap melts, and in Greenland also, the Netherlands will sink. Scandinavia will rise, we will sink. So that's, that's what's happening in the Netherlands, and we are experiencing it. Salt intrusion, which is happening because of uh, these uh, decreased river discharges in dry times, and then, of course, more and intense rainfall. And on top of that, we have a, a tremendous pressure on space because the population is growing and we are already a very uh, densely populated country, one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Um, so that is a number of challenges that we have to cope with, but I'll focus on the, um, um, go on back actually, I'll focus on the um, uh, flood control of course. Uh, what happened in the 1990s because of these uh, river floods is that we started uh, to rethink our flood uh, control po policy. It used to be a, a policy of flood protection for over centuries, I would say, but in the 1990s we shifted more to flood management. And um, where th th there was a whole shift in paradigm, whereas we, we, we have been building for centuries, we have been dam building dams and levees and dikes and pumping water out. And suddenly we realize there is an end to that. You can't just raise your, keep on raising your dikes forever and ever. So we realized we had to sort of accommodate water and um, uh, start living with water. Um, we did so by creating more space for water. What you see over here is a part of the Rhine River, a branch of the Rhine River near Nijmegen. And actually what we did here is we uh, sort of created a second, an, an old branch which, which was there actually, but we reopened it and we gave the river back to it, it, its natural flood plain. We've been harnessing rivers in, 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 in a narrow flood, uh, uh, in a narrow, uh, how you call it, a riverbed, uh, and we forgot about the flood plains they need. So what we did over here is we created an extra branch of the river and we created extra room for the river, so to say. Actually, that's what the program is called. This is one area, but I think there's over 130 uh, spots in the country where we created room for the river. We made extra space to accommodate excess water in times of high river discharges. But that is one example. Uh, another example, actually, is that we are creating room for water in times of uh, high water and excess rainfall in our cities. This is an example of Rotterdam. You see a canal on the right uh, top of the, um, of the slide. That's, yes, that's what it is. This is what it looks like uh, normally, but in times of high water, this, this, uh, you have a floodplain along this canal which, which is uh, able to accommodate much more water. And we, we, we retain it there for a few days until the water level uh, goes down. And then, of course, you can drain this, uh, this um, floodplain again. Another example, uh, um, we are combining a parking garage, an under uh, underground parking garage, with a huge uh, uh, water basin underneath that garage. So in times of high water, th it, this is capable of, of um, um, well, um, accommodating a lot of excess water. I, I, I don't have any figures here. But um, the same goes over here. In times of excess water, the, the, water that, the rain water that falls in, in, in the city, you, you, you collect it here. 
and when the le river level goes down again, you, you can discharge it in the river again. Uh, other examples um, are, um, I think I have one here, no I don't. Um, another example is actually that we are creating um, basins in, uh, in what used to be city squares. The city squares are now being remodeled, uh, they're, they're deepened, so that they created basins. Actually, it's, it's near a school, so they made an artificial theater of it, which is used for all kinds of purposes. You, uh, there is a basketball field in it, it's, it, it, can, it can double as a theater indeed, and it can uh, double as a, a water retention basin. Um, and of course, also we are experimenting with uh, floating houses, floating residential areas, both in Amsterdam and in Rotterdam. Um, We actually, in the 1990s, uh, years 2000, we uh, shifted to a multi-layered safety approach. The uh, lowest uh, uh, bit of this graph actually is, is the, uh, the traditional way, building dams, dikes around areas that are prone to flooding. Um, what I just gave you examples of that we are uh, actually adjusting our infrastructure um, uh, by sustainable spatial planning, so um, creating space for water in cities, creating room for the river, things like that. But the new thing actually that we are only working on for, for 10 years, I would say, is crisis management. And we're trying to risk the limit, uh, to, to limit the risks of, uh, of floods and also limit the consequences of a disaster. And that means that we are preparing for uh, large scale evacuations which we didn't actually until, uh, until 1990. Um, we had this uh, river floods or the threat of river floods in the 1990s and that's uh, the, the first time we came to think about it because we've been taking um, uh, security or safety for floods for granted for ages and this is really a shift in, in our thinking. Um, and actually in this, in this last bit, the crisis management, we have a very good cooperation with the US Army Corps of Engineers and other uh, U.S. Uh, uh, authorities, because this is something we don't have experience with and you have. So, um, all in all, that is a, is a major uh, shift in our thinking. Uh, part, of this, uh, crisis man oh, part, of, part of this crisis management actually is also that we start to raise awareness with people, raise awareness uh, for them to prepare themselves uh, for floods and prepare themselves for evacuation. Um, we do so with very uh, modern uh, uh, methods. We have uh, apps that people can uh, tap in the zip code and they can find whether they are flood prone in a flood prone area or not, and if they're not, uh, how they should prepare. So it's very interesting new techniques where we are trying to uh, um, uh, introduce. Uh, but also, well, th this, this graph says it all, I think. Uh, we have shifted from, from, from this uh, basic flood control uh, uh, first reaction, I would mm -hmm. say, building these dams to this uh, last layer of safety that, that is actually e evacuation. And also may mean retreat, retreat from areas that we have traditionally occupied and uh, we consider no, no longer, let's say, viable for habitation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, what a great robust start to the discussion. Uh, Bart, a lot of the stuff that you've uh, talked about is, is interesting. Your last comment was very interesting, uh, potentially retreating from places uh, that, that, that don't work. Uh, Robert, you talked about the fact that the London plan didn't actually address that possibility. Here in the United States, we uh, build up to the river's edge. We don't leave, in many cases, we don't leave room for flooding. So when we talk about major flooding incidents here, here in the United States, inland flooding in particular, um, you know, a lot of people look at it and say, well, we, we didn't leave a plain. We didn't leave a flood plain. We didn't think about the flood plain. The river's doing, in some cases, what we thought it was going to do. To Robert's earlier point, Sea level rise is exacerbating a problem we've already had, but if you've got inland fr flooding uh, and there's no plain, what do you do about that? David Pierce spoke about uh, strengthening some of the infrastructure, raising it up above the ground, which I suppose you can do in a place like Manhattan. But the Netherlands has population density, as do uh, as does the United States, as do many of the, pro uh, the places that showed up on those maps that some of you showed. Uh, where do you get the space to decide to make room for the river? Uh, is it convenient that the promenade just happened to be available next to the canal? Uh, 
is there real talk about moving people out of settled areas? That river that you showed where you, you reintroduced uh, a flood area for the river, what was involved in that from a policy standpoint? Yep. Um, of course, if you um, uh, want to um, use land for, uh, uh, well, let's say, to accommodate uh, uh, access water, you, you need to buy it. And we're not really stupid. We're also a bit stingy, and uh, so uh, <laughs> we look for areas that are not so, so, so uh, as important. And actually, in this case that I showed you, it was only um, 50, uh, 50 uh, to 100 people that had to be removed. So, um, yeah, we had to buy them out. But at the same time, actually, um, in redeveloping the area, we also created a um, residential area. And that's basically what paid the paint, the paint, the paint, uh, paint uh, buying out these people. So, um, in a way, you can sometimes you do it quite much as we call it. Uh, Kate, that's a combination of the type of work and thinking that the Corps of Engineers would do, as well as policy thinking by people who can buy people out and move them, which is not something the Corps of Engineers can necessarily do very easily. So when you look at these issues, when we have flooding in the United States, uh, what are your range of options when it seems obvious, it would seem obvious to an engineer that part of the problem here is that we've, we've just engineered badly, we're, we're, we're in the water space. Right. Um, well, I think we can think of it as that way. People develop by the water because it was transportation, because it was um, a means of um, moving goods and services up and down the rivers. Uh, some of it is high value land, but I think increasingly it's becoming low value land, which makes it easier to, perhaps to buy them out. Same thing that happened in the Netherlands. Uh, for the Corps of Engineers, back in 1927, we had a really large flood on the, on the Mississippi River. Right. And the plan at that time uh, for the Mississippi River and tributaries included large uh, spillways, uh, as we call them, that, that would move the water off the river and into the side. And one of them during the floods in uh, 2011 uh, really sparked a lot of controversy when people said the Corps is blowing up their levee. But in fact, it was a fuse plug levee designed to be failed uh, during times of really high water. And it's only been operated twice uh, since it was built. Um, so, uh, so we've, we've kind of got this where we need it for the major rivers, but I think his solutions, the idea of lowering the city squares and retaining water, um, really good ideas that we could use here in the U.S. Um, I know Tokyo's got the same idea as your barrage where they've got large tunnels underground that store excess storm water. Uh, we can do a better job managing uh, more frequent type events that will also help us reduce peaks um, overall for large events. It is a different way of thinking about things though, that there's a point at which you fight the water and there's a point at which you accommodate the water. Exactly. And, and that the, the, the answer may lie in a bit of both. Right, and so it's always, I think it's for all of us here, uh, you have to do multiple, multiple approaches. Mm -hmm. It's not silver bullet, it's silver buckshot. Um, we have to do each one of these kinds of actions. Obviously for the Navy, they do have to hold the line for these Navy bases. There's not a choice right. there, and this is where engineering and new solutions could be very helpful. But as he said, it's got to go outside the fence line, and the people have to be able to come to work to, to do their job. So it is everything, everything that we do together. So Admiral, let's talk about this. I know you're not in a position to get political about this, but as that article that uh, Kate uh, showed the slide for illustrates, this is the New York Times, and there have been, there have been similar articles in major publications. Um, you don't have certain flexibility uh, in what you do, and you do need support, and there are still uh, elements of the population, maybe, maybe in here, probably not, but, but all over the country, that, that isn't disputing whether it's gonna be 85 centimeters in the next uh, uh, you know, 85 years or, or 95 years, or it's gonna be 100 centimeters. Some of them are saying it's gonna be nothing, uh, and, and there are some people making policy decisions that uh, work against what various branches of the military need to do in order to plan. How do you, how do you deal with that? <clears throat> you know, I think, um, you know, I think it's a case-by-case -case solution, right? What we have learned, what I've recently learned and, and reinforced by uh, Professor Nichols last night is it's not one size fits all around the world or even amongst our coasts. I think uh, some places there is rise, some places there is fall. 
uh, and I think that's a common misperception. So there are installations that we are much more concerned about than others, and I think it's gonna have to get more of our attention. Um, I think it's true, the Navy can't move too far away from the coastline. Everybody <laughs> understands that fact. Uh, but we're, I think we're a long way away from any sort of decision that we're going to move. Um, maybe, maybe, if, maybe if things go to six feet, we can talk about that. And when there are two, I think we're still in the nuisance flooding range. The question for me is in the unknown. You know, we, in the near term, we'll, we'll improve our maintenance. We'll improve, improve our resilience, our ability to respond so that we can get functional faster and then respond to the community. Um, perhaps ever more, we'll invest more. But at some point, I really would like to acknowledge is, is the wise, is the most wise that it can be. Bart, when you talked about, uh, and, and you said you think it might be more, um, is that when you say more, are you saying that the Netherlands is more vulnerable or you actually think that uh, the, the scientific community is underestimating the range of, of uh, sea level rise? Well, actually both. Um, well, it's not so much that the uh, scientific uh, community is underestimating it. No, I, I mentioned that because in this slide it said 35 centimeters to 85 centimeters and actually the latest calculations predict that it's going to be more than, than than, than that, so more than a meter. Uh, but also because we're more vulnerable, and I try to explain that by uh, saying that uh, the country is sinking itself. So because of this, 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 uh, this equilibrium between Scandinavia and Greenland uh, going up when the ice cap melts and we are going down. And then also um, um, we have to be very careful in draining our country. Actually, the whole story of the Netherlands is a man-made disaster because um, it was built on peat and clay. And what we did is we started cultivating the land in, as a year 800, 900, and people want to have dry feet, so they, uh, they started to drain the peat. And you know what happens then is that the peat uh, subsides. So, so, and, and that exacerbated the problem over the centuries. So um, we need to be very careful what we're doing with the, uh, with the uh, uh, water levels in the underground, uh, because it's sinking. All right. uh, let me ask you, uh, Professor, you talked about uh, you, when you put the time over the water level increase and you talked about uh, the year 2100 and you said it might not get that f high, it might never get that high. Uh, what is the thinking about the, the time over which the sea level is likely to rise and, and your sense of does that stop or do we build for several meters of, uh, of rise? Well, I think the sea level is very, very uncertain, and that's one of the kind of core problems here that, I mean, I think many engineers are looking, saying, give me certainty and I can plan for it, but unfortunately we can't do that. The IPCC, they talk from 30 centimetres up to like a metre, but then um, really, when you look at the IPCC estimates, they're not covering the full range of uncertainty. So in the UK, we have this H++ scenario was on the slide, and that's really essentially two meters by 2100. We're not saying that will happen, but we're saying it might. But what's safe? In other words, if you wanted, if somebody, if, if we got everybody in the world to uh, believe that this is a, a, a problem and say, okay, fine, let's tell me how much money you need to really mitigate this or how much you need to really mitigate. Um, do we mitigate for the idea that over 500 years we're going to see constant increases? If, if London said two meters, would that really take care of it for a really long time? I guess I'm trying to figure out, is there an organic solution to this rather than major infrastructure rebuilds on an ongoing basis? I don't, for, for big, for cities, I don't think that we're talking about massive engineering. And I think the answer to your question is we don't really know. It's, that's why I think what I was talking about, the idea of adapt, let's, this is a very uncertain problem. We can see that we're going to deal with a rise. We are certain of the sign. That's certainly in London, maybe Juneau, Alaska is different, but we're certain of the sign in most places uh, that we care about. And it, taking on an adaptive management approach means that we adapt in an appropriate manner and we have to expect we're going to have to commit resources, but I can't tell you how many resources. Right. I can say if we plan, we can probably make it a lot cheaper in yeah, the long Yeah, no run. kidding. A uh, little bit of work before the fact. David, let's talk about that. You're, you're between a rock and a hard place uh, at, at the uh, electrical utilities. You'd like to plan. 
it tends to be reactive because that's the only time it gets everyone's attention. The rest of the time, they don't want you increasing their rates. Uh, so what is it that you, how is it that you manage this? You, you spoke uh, optimistically about having an influence on the things that contribute to greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases and strengthening the infrastructure. Do you have the resources, the public support, uh, the ability to plan, the ability to influence enough to do that? So at this point in time, I'd say yes, right? So awareness is a key thing. And before 2012, before Hurricane Sandy, there wasn't broad awareness. There wasn't broad acceptance. It's like, okay, yes, we've seen you know some inching up of the water at the battery. Um, that's where we measure high tide. So you know, we, we, records have been kept in New York. It's been a, a maritime city for a very long time. So so we've known that it's been increasing. Uh, the the severity of the impact from Hurricane Sandy really got everyone's attention. So. Very shortly after Hurricane Sandy, it was very easy for us to get a billion dollars from our, um, our regulator to say, go ahead and do uh, the, the most pressing hardening work that you needed. All the stakeholders who were involved, the real estate interest, et cetera, you really didn't hear much pushback. If anything, it was more of a, well, is that everything that you need to do right now? Okay, it was, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, we, you have to remember, so it's, it's a trillion dollars worth of real estate in New York, okay? Um, so once you get the attention of the people who really own that trillion dollars worth of real estate, you can really um, accomplish a lot. And so we, we got their attention. So that's like Donald Trump and a few other guys. <laughs> that, that's, a big, uh, that's a big part of the, yeah. the demographics there. And I think that's a good in, way to think about it. In other cities, once you get the attention, you will begin to see people saying, okay, let's, let's approach this. So this leads me to a, a bigger question, and, and this is really open to anyone. Who, whose problem is this? That's an interesting point. You, you, got, you got in New York, it happened to us. We didn't think it was going to happen. I covered it. I remember being uh, on the southern tip of Manhattan. Uh, and so the media was all there. The property owners were there. New York went dark for a few days, which are parts of it. Many parts of New York didn't recover for months. Uh, so you got everybody's attention. And now the city and the state, uh, you know, initially it's federal money. But if we are going to plan, if we're going to put an ounce of prevention into this as opposed to just uh, response, who, who, where's that come from? Which, who here thinks they know who should be in charge of making this decision? or deciding that there is a plan? Where does it start? Start with you, Professor. Well, I mean, I'd say it's, it's, I think it's obviously my problem, but it's our problem as well. So I think, you know, back to the point, individual, individual major um, infrastructure owners, it's, you know, when, when, you, when you're controlling a big space, it's your problem. But I think when we think about sea level rise affecting large areas, it's clearly got to be at some level collective. So there must be a role for government there in, as well. So I think it's trying to find the right balance. Mm -hmm. It's going to vary from place to place. I wouldn't say you can say, but, but it, it, you need to have local action, private action, but you also need to have public action and, you know, and, and, regu and some guidance on how that public action should take place. So David, in the case of Sandy, uh, there were a lot of things, a lot of people who had problems, right? There was real estate, there was electricity, there was gas, there was uh, subways, transportation. Uh, so do, do you feel like the right people took charge? And, and is there that collaboration necessary to, to make sure that when that happens again, we're in slightly better position or we're better prepared? I think, th I think they did. Uh, and it's, it's a stakeholder issue. It's, it's everyone involved. It's the scientists who are making the predictions, uh, the, the governmental agencies who set policy, and then the individual, you know, either industries or agencies that actually build the infrastructure and maintain. Uh, each group has to then look at what their contribution is to the overall solution. So we're going to make sure the lights stay on so the trains can keep running. The trains are going to do what they can to prevent their, their tunnels from becoming bathtubs, okay? Uh, it's going to be each, each, each sector is going to look at what they need to do, right? I'm sure the, you know, the Navy and the shipping agencies, they're going to look at what they need to do to keep you know, commerce flowing. So it's, it's a broad spectrum approach which requires everyone to really you know, be in the discussion. It, some people are going to do more earlier than others, right? So, I mean, so because we're fundamental, we're going to have to be at the tip of the spear, 
making sure that our stuff is is there right. and working every day. Uh, but I think other sectors are going to have to come in and, and make their own contribution. In some circumstances, including some non-urban circumstances, the Corps of Engineers is the tip, tip of the spear. In fact, for a lot of people, we they, they only know that, well, okay, it's that bad, the Corps of Engineers is here now, uh, and, you know, uh, the, kudos to you, it, it, it often works, and it, it, it's, uh, we know that that's, when the Corps of Engineers is in, it's big, it's a big deal. W what is your relationship to how policy should be made uh, and how this should be remediated? Uh, I'm gonna agree with everybody else. It's, it's all of us that are responsible, and in the U.S., it's the people and the people that represent them, the politicians that actually end up making the policy. Uh, and we, we carry that policy out. We try to do the best job we can to engineer it or in places where engineering isn't potentially the right solution, we try to come up with another kind of solution. So it's really everybody. Uh, so, so I'm gonna push you on that okay. though. What happens, because you, you did put that article up there and, and in that article, it makes very clear that the people and the people who they elect to represent them do not all share the view that this is a serious problem. Right, and I think that that would happen with any of an, a large society problem that not everybody has the same perspective on that. And so we have to try to understand those perspectives. We have to communicate with the people and we have to try to provide them with the facts uh, that are necessary for them to understand what are, the, what are the range of solutions and what are the pluses and minuses of each of those solutions. And this is really where engineers come in because we translate the science into actionable information for the people, for the, for the consultants, for the private sector. So, um, you know, we have to respect those perspectives. Um, we don't necessarily have to provide a solution that fits those, uh, those perspectives. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go to Bart then. Bart, tell me, you're a, you're a representative of a government. You, um, and on a lot of levels uh, in terms of uh, the things we struggle with a little bit in the United States in terms of both climate change and uh, the environment. The Netherlands is, is a cutting edge nation. People have what we would think of as fairly advanced views of a world that is changing and how they fit into it. Who leads the discussion in, in the Netherlands on these matters? Is it military? Is it, uh, is it private sector? Is it the government? Is it all like, what, give me a model for how this is dealt with. On this, I would say the government uh, and NGOs are leading, so it's, po it's politics, basically. Yeah, that's leading on this. It's not the military. Um, I think, in a way, you could say that the Netherlands is very lucky uh, to have been uh, combating sea level rise for over centuries, because uh, there is, there is, there's not a really uh, tough political debate on this. There's right, you don't, get you don't get a lot of pushback when 26% of your country is under sea level. If it, if it, <laughs> Everybody realizes that right. that's, it's a common interest. Right. So there's consensus on, on uh, making funds available for uh, combating sea level rise, and it's been there for, for ages. Um, it's a, um, a shared responsibility. We do that on a central government level. But we also have water boards, and they used to be, in, 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 in the old times, they, they used to be regional bodies that actually took care of the regional uh, uh, flood control. And they still exist. That means that they've been there for eight, 900 years. So it's a collective responsibility. The, the government actually takes care of the large-scale uh, engineering works that I showed on, on, on this slide. And, and then the, uh, the water boards are responsible for the smaller scale uh, and, and, and more uh, detailed uh, uh, water management in the regions. Uh, and there isn't a real discussion about it. Uh, water boards are financed and they finance a project by taxes, local taxes, water taxes, and everybody has to pay it. And everybody does. Because it's, it's so, uh, let's say, in our DNA, that, that is something we have to take care of. That, yeah. That, that makes a difference uh, with countries that... Uh, you you that Europeans have a slightly more comfortable time. relationship with taxes than we do in America I know, as well. I know, yeah, but maybe that's why. So <laughs> it might be. Uh, Admiral. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can't help but think that this is the journey we're on, right, is raising the level of, of uh, coordination. I mean, it, it's a fact for us that we're experiencing more flooding in our bases. It's just a fact. You can decide what you think causes that, but we're responding to more floods. We have a flood at the Naval Academy, we respond and we fix it. We have a flood at Norfolk, we respond and we fix it. Um, I think the journey has been, we've been uh, attacking this inside our fence line, 
principally now through means that are rather simple to improve maintenance of our mechanisms that remove the water from the, from the base, uh, changing our engineering standards, uh, land use standards, these kinds of things. But, um, I mean, you think about it, uh, what makes a base operate? It's the people, and the people live out in town, principally civil service, uh, industry, and many of our military members. They're not living on the base, they need to come from out in town. Um, so it really makes no sense for me to raise the roads on the base if the town doesn't raise the roads at the same time. And I think about it in terms of utilities as well. Most of our military installations receive utility services from Mountain Town, like Con Edison and others. Um, and again, um, you know, if the local provider uh, upgrades and raises the level of uh, sewage lines, and I don't do that on the base, again, we have a problem. And so there's a great amount of coordination that has to happen that takes our thinking from the fence line to the community, and then probably beyond that. Uh, one of the things they can do in the Netherlands is they can endlessly point to examples. You can always see some part of the Netherlands that's a little wetter than you would hope it would be. Um, in the United States, we've, we've often made these decisions and in other parts of the world around storms or around major flooding incidents. Uh, Professor, one of the things that you've made a reference to, I, I know it as sunny day flooding, you called something else? Nuisance flooding. Nuisance flooding. A few of you have referred to nuisance flooding. Tell me about that phenomenon and the trend line that it's on. Well, I mean, it, nuisance flooding is basically, uh, we associate a flood with an extreme event. We're increasingly seeing floods occurring um, under sort of what you might call normal or blue sky conditions when water's in the street and um, there are places like Atlantic City where it's gone maybe like sort of 30, 40 days a year. Now there are floods in the street when in the 60s it would have been one or two, and this is happening along the entire... And what, what causes that? If there isn't rain and there isn't a storm surge, what's, what's flooding the well, cities? Well, it's, it's the... Um, the sea level is rising, so, so a flood is, a, is, a, is the sum of the mean, the tide, and, the, and then anything the weather's doing. So now, as sea level rises, you need a smaller amount of weather-induced um, sea level, temporary sea level rise to cause a flood. So it's, it's reducing the threshold that will, that will cause, cause, cause... And in, in nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding, you're often seeing water coming through drains. A absolutely. So, I mean, in the UK, when we, we've, we actually have flat valves. So essentially, we have things that close off and, we, uh, and so it stops it happening. So, I mean, there are, there are simple um, adaptations that can be done, but in the US, traditionally, you haven't needed them. So it's, it's, it's one of these tipping points where you almost have to think, you know, you, you're going to have to spend some money to stop it or you live with it. Or you spend a lot of money if you don't stop it and you can't live with it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you about the, the engineering involved in this, because that's uh, uh, what the, the, the few people in this room might be very interested in. Um, is there a lot of dispute about the engineering? Is there, are there discoveries that need to be made or new engineering that needs to come to light? Or are there best practices that we should or do already share uh, that can be sort of almost boxed and shipped around the world to say, here, here's, this can be adapted to your needs? Tell me about the differences or the innovations in the engineering uh, for, for flooding, for seawater rise. Any of you can take that. Well, I mean, I'd say it's, we've, we've heard before from others on the, on the panel, I think there's no silver bullet here. I think there I are, think we liked silver buckshot. We heard that. Yeah, like that right? but, but I think that we have an awful lot of, of, of engineering technology already in place. I think one of the big challenges is actually using it in a coherent way. Um, so uh, I, I think the innovation probably will be happening mainly in the issue of modeling so that we can start to think about, or we are thinking about, virtual storms rather than real storms and much better forecasts and warnings, etc. So I think there's a lot of innovation there in the informatics in terms of things like dikes or beach nourishment or um, what have you. Um, I think those technologies are very mature. I think working with nature probably is also another place where we could actually um, really learn to understand if you do put in a marsh how much less of a seawall do you need we don't really we're not able to do that so probably informatics and using nature as much as we can together with traditional
traditional engineering, to me, are the, the sort of two kind of big questions for sea level response. Kate, you spoke, to, you spoke a lot about that. You just touched on it, but each one of those slides in their own would be so meaningful. Uh, tell me about where you think we are in how much we know about this. Is, is it like Professor says, mostly in figuring out how we use it, in modeling, in coordination? Uh, is it a, a money resource issue? Where are, where, where are we? Because you, you put up, I think, 10 different options, right. right? Yeah, I'm gonna agree that for many of the structural options, uh, we know a lot about them, and I think the, the issue we're facing in the US is the cost reduction. Are there different materials? Are there different ways to stage these or phase these so that they can be adaptable over time in a way that's less expensive? For example, if we consider a coastal uh, situation, if we put in an eye wall as part of a flood wall, we can only adapt it so much. But if we, if we prepare the foundation first and build a T wall, we can actually increase the height of that. So the idea of what are the really cost-effective life cycle approaches, uh, again, the modeling will help us figure out what to do, but I think in terms of natural nature base, this is what the people seem to want. The fact that the evidence is primarily anecdotal doesn't seem to stop them, but I think for us, it's the idea that we need information. You know, we have evidence that for marshes, for example, that under certain kinds of submergence, they can actually increase the wave run up at the land surface. And so the idea that you could actually, under a large events, be making the problem worse is something that you have to think about if you're doing serious engineering. So. Uh, again, I'd say some modeling, cost effectiveness in construction and in phasing and in materials, and then um, understanding better What's the, the biggest barrier to getting it all done? Uh, if I said go ahead and just figure it out, uh, what's, what do you think the largest issue is? Is it money? Is it uh, acceptance? Is it how things look and how they change? Well, I, I think that really for us as an agency, for the federal government in the US, it's the way we do benefit cost analyses. Because our projects are not driven by selecting an elevation and then building to that elevation. It's about optimizing the benefits and costs. And the issue with economics is that once you get out past 20 to 50 years, you can't make a case for building those adaptation, those bigger foundations now, those larger levee foundations that can be adapted easily in the future because the value of the money today of 50 years out isn't, isn't there. And yet the issue is there is no more money, right? We're all constrained now, and they're going to be even more constrained in the future. So where's the balance? How do we do those economic analyses in a way that supports adaptation in the future? Well, that's why I'm glad that this is the topic we've chosen for this panel this year, because uh, infrastructure builds are not politically palatable these days, which is strange, but they're not. Uh, they, they have a lot of benefits to them, but they, they're not. And this subset is, is not in the public eye until something happens. Right. You know, so the idea that we really have to think this out and we really have to make policy decisions based on it. Uh, Bart, what, again, allowing for the fact that for hundreds of years uh, the Dutch have had to think about this, um, what tends to be the barrier to making decisions on large scale projects? Um, of course, it's also cost. Yeah. So th there is a, there is a, um, a limit to, what you, uh, to the funds you have available. Although we are very lucky to have a uh, structural funding for, for these kinds of things. We have uh, uh, a uh, infrastructure fund and a delta fund. Delta fund speci specifically created to, uh, to uh, fund uh, all these uh, flood control works. And it runs up to 2030. So whichever decision you take now, you know it's not going to be challenged in a few years from now, even not with it, a different government. Right. So it's there. So the finance for these, these, these kinds of projects is, is there. And then, of course, there is, um, uh, there is uh, the, uh, the challenge of the, uh, the engineering techniques, um, which is also um, a challenge because we started thinking differently about uh, engineering. Uh, the slides that I showed you, these huge hard sea walls, um, uh, they've come under attack because they're a, um, uh, a challenge to ecosystems. So we're shifting towards uh, the examples that Kathleen also mentioned, uh, towards uh, building with nature. And we have uh, very good examples of that. We have, we have, for instance, created a sand motor, as we call it. We had one, 
we're actually constantly uh, re, uh, re, uh, replenishing or nourishing beaches along our coast, and we're doing that. We have been doing that for, for decades, actually, at various spots. And what we did now is uh, we created one spot in the southwest of the country, making use uh, a huge replenishment over there. So a lot of, 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 of sand was, was sprayed on there. And we made use of the uh, predominant current along our coast, which is southwest, northeast. And the current took the sand along, and it replenished the, uh, the coastline for over 60 kilometers. So that is, that is a cost-effective way, because you don't need to uh, replace your dredging uh, um, um, equipment all the time. Uh, you don't affect uh, ecosystems uh, right in front of the coast where you're doing that. So the, these kinds of ideas, also the, uh, the idea of creating uh, artificial marshes, actually, to, uh, to um, uh, avoid uh, um, flooding in certain areas. We're working with that as well. So there's technical challenges as well, I would say. And we're, um, yeah, we're developing that now. Yeah. Admiral. Uh, cer certainly. So, uh, funding is a challenge. You know, it's just a reality. Funding is a challenge, and uh, uh, we in the Navy will bias our funding to the mission uh, before we bias it to the shore, right? So we'll bias it to ships and submarines and aircraft and Marines and training. Right. So that's I was sort of getting at that. Where in the in the ranking of priorities uh, does this fall? Yeah, so we, we take risk ashore at maintaining our facilities today, s smart risk. Um, but I would say if you ask me what's the problem for me today, is it, is it money or something else? I think knowledge has to precede the funding. I mean, I'm not in a position I don't feel yet in many locations to go to Navy leadership and say, uh, uh, don't fund that ship, let's put that into the shore, you know, at Naval Station Norfolk because. You know, we aspire to get to that level of knowledge, but um, not, not there yet. We don't have that kind of certainty, right? Uh, that, that's what I'm after is more certainty to make those decisions. But uh, uh, I think there's so much we can do uh, that, that's kind of reasonable engineering and, and, and um, affordable engineering at this point. The, um, the examples of what's happening in the Netherlands tells us what's possible. <laughs> you know, with maybe perhaps a very large budget, but uh, I think we're a long ways off from that. Uh, I am interested in, you know, the concept of uh, public-private venture, uh, third-party financing, how uh, that mechanism which we use in our housing today, military housing today, is, is really run by industry, owned and run by industry, uh, with, uh, with uh, Wall Street money. Uh, we're doing that for energy projects on our basis. Uh, I wonder if some of these challenges might also have to go down uh, that line of thinking uh, as we proceed. It's interesting to me, it didn't come up in uh, last night's debate for anybody who watched it, but uh, both of our presidential candidates are discussing uh, infrastructure funding, infrastructure banks, pr public-private partnerships, something that uh, BART, the rest of the world is much more familiar with and much more used to. For some reason, we're a little allergic to it uh, in the United States. I want to discuss, uh, I, want to, I want to take this, uh, I think I might give everybody a break to use restrooms. Sure, yeah, I'm getting some nods. You guys should be into that? All right, well, when I, when I, when I, um, what I want to do is I want to take this conversation a little bit more uh, globally. The Admiral talked about shipping lines uh, and the, the dangers to them. Uh, we want to talk about parts of the world that are not just in danger of uh, some sunny day nuisance flooding, but uh, disappearing entirely. And then I want to go to your questions. So uh, why don't we take about, uh, I, I know the, you have an engineering problem with the bathrooms here. Um, I discuss this every year and you don't seem to solve it. Uh, so I have to give you a good amount of time. I think I'll give you, uh, let, let's, can we be back in our seats as much as possible at 11.15? If, if nature doesn't allow for that, you can straggle in. But uh, 11.15, let's uh, reconvene with this conversation. Thank you.